So have you ever had any trouble? Ever had any, any, any trouble in life? It's a story about a guy named Henry that moved away from his hometown. He uh, went back to his hometown a couple of years later for a visit and bumped into his old friend Kip. He said, hey, Kip, I heard while I've been gone that you got married. Kip said, yeah, I did. I, I got married. And he said, you know, it's been nothing but trouble ever since. Trouble? What, what you mean, Henry asked? What, what kind of trouble? Well, my wife, Ethel, all she talks to me about is money. Money, 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 money. It's all I hear all the time. Henry said, well, Kip, how much money have you given her? Kip said, well, none yet. That's, that's a different kind of trouble, right? A lot of trouble in life, right? We, we, we find trouble almost anywhere that we go. Trouble finds us sometimes almost anywhere we go. But, but what do we do? How do we deal with trouble? How do we, how do we step into trouble and, and work through trouble? We continue our series that we call Doors, where we're looking at some of the most defining doors that we go through in every day of our life. And today, our message is overhead doors. And we'll be looking at John 14, verse 1. And, and in John 14, verse 1, Jesus is going to tell us how to deal with trouble. So again, I just want to ask your hearts, are you having any trouble today? See, I, I know some of your stories. And, and I know what kind of trouble some of you are in. I've, I've got trouble of my own. So, so we're all in some sense in some kind of trouble. We're having to work through some kind of trouble. So I just want to repeat what I just said. Jesus is about to tell us how to deal with trouble. Not one or two of them, but, but all of them. Every trouble that we face in life. So what does Jesus have to say? John 14, verse 1, this is what he says. Do not let your heart be troubled. The scene here is pretty thick. It's the night before the crucifixion. Jesus is with his disciples. They've been observing the Passover meal. And, and during dinner, Jesus laid down some heavy things in the conversations. We're, we're just going to look at a, a few of them. First, Jesus said that one of them was going to betray him. Now, now, this would have been shocking at dinner that night, that there was someone in that room that was going to turn Jesus over to the religious leaders that wanted him dead. There wouldn't have been this thing that everybody went, oh yeah, see only two people at the table knew what was happening. And the other 11, they didn't immediately look down at the end of the table to the guy dressed like the undertaker and went, oh yeah, it's, it's him. That's, that's the, it's Judas. Knew it all along. I knew it was Judas. No, that wasn't going through anyone's mind. These men who had spent almost every minute together for the better part of three years suddenly are looking around at one another saying, who in the world could do this? How in the world is there someone at this table that would betray Jesus. So they were troubled with the news of betrayal. Jesus also told them that Peter was going to deny that he even knew him. Peter, of all people at the table, the last person that would deny Jesus. This is Simon Peter, Mr. Passionate follower of Jesus. He loved Jesus. He was devoted to Jesus. No way Peter would deny him. And yet that's what Jesus said. So they are troubled with the news about this denial. But there's something worse, something even more troubling. Jesus went on to say that he was leaving, that, that he was gone. The, these men left everything to follow Jesus. I mean, let me just ask you a question. Have you ever moved, you know? I mean, my parents have lived in the same house since 1969. I'm pretty sure my in-laws have lived in the same house since about the same time. We've moved a lot. 
<laughs> I don't even remember some of our addresses. My friend Steve used to say, dude, I don't even write your name in my address anymore. I just use pencil. You know, I just, I know it's going to change. So I've had a lot of change in life. But these men left their homes, their job. They left everything. Everything changed because they followed Jesus. And now Jesus is saying he's leaving. He's bailing on them. And by the way, they can't go with him. So what are they going to do? So they're troubled about the betrayal. They're troubled about the denial. And now they're troubled about this departure. Jesus is leaving. But here's the thing. Jesus knew they were troubled. Jesus knew what they were thinking. He knew what they were feeling. So let me just encourage you. Whatever your trouble is right now in life, Jesus knows what you are thinking and he knows what you are feeling. Like, like he knows. It's, it's part of his character. That he knows your fear, he knows your worry, he knows your anger, he knows your stress, he knows your anxiety. Jesus knows it all. This, this isn't fairy tale, frou-frou language. This is the language of the Bible. It is the character of Jesus. He knows you. He knows what's going on. And he knew that on that night his friends were And so what does he say to them? He says, do not let your heart be troubled. This is one of the most amazing things that Jesus ever said. Basically what he's saying to us is this, we do not have to be controlled by trouble. We don't have to let trouble trouble us. We don't have to be controlled by fear and, and worry and anger and, and all the other emotions in life. We don't have to be controlled by those things. We don't have to give in to those things. With tons and tons of mercy and love and grace, Jesus is not just giving them a pep talk. The language here is a command. So Jesus is saying, when you get troubled, stop. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Just, just stop it. It's going to happen. You know, we're not perfect, so we're going to get troubled. We're going to get afraid. We're going to get mad and angry and scared and, and lots of other things. But Jesus says, just, just stop. You know, don't, don't keep doing it. Don't let your heart be troubled. That sounds cute, right? No, oh, okay. I won't let my heart be troubled. I mean, it sounds a lot easier said than done, right? But, but how? how? How would we actually do that? How would we actually stop being troubled? How do you stop having a heart it's troubled. Well, maybe one thing that might help us is to look at a moment in Jesus's life where he was troubled, <laughs> right? The guy is telling us, don't be troubled, was troubled. Does that make Jesus a hypocrite? By no means. Let's just consider what's happening in the scene. So one day the news comes to Jesus that his friend Lazarus has died. And John records how Jesus reacted. In John 11, verse 33, he said this, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. Well, why was Jesus troubled? Well, there's been a lot of guesstimates, but if you look at what's happening before, during, and after this moment, it seems that Jesus is troubled over the reality of sin and death. The reality that sin and death are a real thing. Think of it this way. Have you ever seen something in the news that troubled you? You know, something about the, the economy or something about politics or, or something about, you know, some violent crime. And you saw it and it troubled you not in a way when, oh, that's sad, but in a way that you went, you know what, that's not right. That, that's not right. I, I don't want things to be like that. That's a sense of, of the trouble that Jesus is experiencing. He's, he's troubled at the reality of sin and death. He's troubled at the limited but true power of, of Satan and all of his evil agents in the world. He's troubled by what's happening. So how does Jesus deal with his trouble? Well, in just a short time after this, the Bible records the historical account of how Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. Yeah, that's, that's a thing. 
Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He wasn't just mostly dead. He was dead dead. And Jesus, through his own indestructible life, raised Lazarus from the dead. And it's amazing, and it's beyond our comprehension. It's not something we see every day at the hospital. But it's true because there were people who were not Christians, people who did not believe in Jesus, who hated Jesus, that were around the scene, and they saw it with their own eyes. So yes, it's a miracle that Lazarus was raised from the dead, but Lazarus died again. He still physically died again. I guess you could say I could, I could die today and, and God could, could raise me somehow from the dead, resurrect me, but, but I'm going to die again. It might be 30 days from now or 30 years from now, but, but something is going to cause my physical death. I will actually die. But according to everything that we see in the scripture, at the very least, my physical death will be just a sting. Why? Because Jesus was troubled. What does that mean? This is what it means. It means that not only was Jesus troubled with the reality of sin and death and the death of his friend Lazarus, not only was Jesus troubled at the limited but true power of Satan and all of his evil agents in the world, but Jesus was also troubled because in a matter of days, a matter of weeks, he would be arrested, brutally tortured, brutally executed on a cross for every single sin in the world. All of my sin and all of your sin. And that was troubling. However, Jesus also in that same troubling moment knew that he was going to defeat the dominating power of death once and for all. Jesus was going to do something that only he could do. He was going to make a way for your soul to be well. Your spouse doesn't have that ability. Your parents don't have that ability. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your favorite politician, your favorite athlete, whoever it is in your no one has the power to make your soul well. They can throw you a graduation party, a, a birthday party. They can take you out for a nice meal. They can buy you a car. They can take you to Disney World. I mean, there's a lot of things people can do that make us happy, make us enjoyable for some period of time. But no one can make your soul well outside of God. Only God has that ability. Jesus knew in that troubling moment that as much as he was troubled, he knew that he was the answer. He was the one, as the song says, that was going to turn graves into gardens. Jesus is the only one who can make your soul well. He's the only one that can make death, at best, a sting. Maybe a terrible, awful sting, but just a terrible, awful sting. Why? Why is that true? Why will my death be at best, or at least however you want to say it, a terrible, awful sting? Well, here's why. Because all of this is not a fairy tale. See, death won't be a sting because I'm a pastor, or because I'm a good guy, or because I'm an American, or because I like the fries at Bojangles. Death will be a sting because this is not a fairy tale. Because right now, I am believing in the truth about Jesus. And Lord willing, by his grace, I will believe in that truth about Jesus until I breathe my very last breath. That everything Jesus said about himself is true. That everything Jesus did is true. That Jesus was truly born in a manger in Bethlehem. That Jesus truly grew up and he healed a man that was born blind and he rescued a woman who was about to be murdered for adultery. That he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. 
that he gave eternal life to a filthy criminal hanging on the cross next to him, that he was crucified, that he was buried, that he was dead, and that on the third day he was risen, and that he truly is at the right hand of God, and that he is truly coming again, and because I'm believing in and relying on and clinging to all of the overwhelming truth about Jesus, when the sting of death come, it will be gain for me. Death will be gain. Is that your story? Will death be gain for you? The reality of of being in relationship with the one true living God, of, of having this indestructible life in Jesus, will death be gain? If not, then we would plead with you right now, turn your eyes upon Jesus. For the good of your soul, for the good of your family, for your friends, for the people that you work and go to school with who who might be dead in their sin or, or might just be troubled, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn everything that you have upon Jesus. Why? So that you cannot be troubled with trouble. Now, I'll admit, that sounds real pie in the sky, right? Because, hey, we're sitting here in a comfortable room with nice air conditioning, everything's fine. But in the hard moments, not being troubled with trouble, well, that that just sounds kind of hokey. So how is it that, that we can say that? Well, I would just simply put it this way. Don't get too tied up with Baptists and Methodists and Episcopalian and Judaism. Catholicism, Islam, Mormonism, SEC and and ACC and Ford and Chevy and Coke and Pepsi and Republican and Democrat, whatever categories you swim in, don't swim in them too deeply. Rather, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Consider Jesus. Evaluate Jesus. Engage with Jesus. That's the answer that Jesus is giving his friends. He's saying, look at me, consider me, evaluate me, engage with me. Why? Because unlike Lazarus, Jesus died, but he was risen from the grave and he's never died again. He's still alive right now. He's he's at the right hand of God. He will never die again, and he is the only hope for death becoming a sting. He's the only hope for your grave turning into a garden, the only hope for your soul being well. He's the only soap, only hope of forever. The only one. There's, there's no other You can search the whole world over and you'll find some great things, but you won't find Jesus because he is the answer of all answers. Not because this is church, but because of the overwhelming evidence of who he was and who he is. So that Jesus turned to his friends in this moment right before he was brutally executed. And he said, hey, don't let your heart be troubled. How? Why? I mean, when their world was about to fall apart, how in the world were they not going to be troubled? Now, what about us? I mean, do you feel like some things in your life right now are falling apart? Do you feel like the trouble in your life is has gotten a little too much to manage? How in the world can you not be troubled? What is Jesus getting at? Well, he tells us, next part of verse one, believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus says, guys, I know you already believe in God. That's why you left everything to follow me. And I know because you're following me and because we've been together, 
you, you do the math and you've gotten the math that I'm the one. That, that I am the one that God has sent to rescue. I'm, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Savior. Y'all are all confident in that. And so because you believe in God, because you have come to understand that I'm the one, keep believing. That's the key to dealing with a troubled heart. Keep believing. Keep believing in the truth about Jesus. You see, the Bible does not describe saving faith and salvation as a one-time event that happens at camp or church. It's not. Nowhere in the Bible is it a one-time event where you pray a sinner's prayer, shake the preacher's hand, get baptized, you're done, I got that checked off, you know, I'm fine. We were laughing this morning, there's a scene in one of the pirate movies where the guy was reading the Bible and, and he said, I thought you couldn't read. He goes, yeah, but I'm, I'm trying and it's the Bible, so it counts for something. <laughs> there's nothing that counts for nothing when it comes to salvation if you don't know Jesus. Doesn't matter how many times you've been to church. Doesn't matter how many times you've given to charity. Doesn't matter how many times that you sat down and tried to read the Bible. The only thing that matters when we breathe our last is whether we have truly been saved and redeemed by Jesus. Whether we have given our hearts to him. So do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Everything in your universe today and everything in your infinity hinges on that truth. The Bible describes saving faith as something that you are doing all of the time. Not a one-time event, but an all-the-time event. I heard someone describe this using a car one time. It's like I can believe that my car will get me home from the hot dog king when I'm over there getting chili dogs. Right? I believe my car will get me home. But it would be foolish for me to sit in the parking lot and think happy thoughts about getting home. No, what's going to happen? I'm going to crank the car up. I'm going to put my hands on the steering wheel. I'm going to put my foot on the gas. I'm going to drive the car home. Friend, you need to drive your faith home. Saving faith is something that you do. It's something you receive. You can only receive from God, but it's something that you do once you've received it. Saving faith is something that we do over and over and over again. And the ultimate key to dealing with all the trouble in life, especially our troubled heart, is going to be keep believing in Jesus. Keep believing in Jesus. Keep believing in Jesus. But if we're honest, we don't always want to do that. I mean, we, we can try to act all Christian and religious, but we all know it's true. There are, there are moments in life where we don't feel like believing in Jesus. We don't. Where the, the circumstances have rattled us. We can't always keep our faith flowing through our emotions. But we can't always keep our faith flowing through our mind. See, I may have a, a moment where I don't feel like Jesus is real. But I know Jesus is real. He has proven himself 300 years before he was even born with more than 300 prophecies. He's proven himself. And when he was on this earth, through his birth, through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, everything about Jesus keeps measuring up no matter how many times he's attacked. So I may not feel like Jesus is real, but I know Jesus is real. And I may have moments where I don't feel like Jesus is king, but I know Jesus is king. This is the answer Jesus gave his friends. Hey, I'm real. I, I am the king of all kings. So trust me. Keep believing. Keep believing. Keep believing believing. Jared and Megan Mellinger found out six years ago that their two-year-old daughter at the time, Agatha, they call her Aggie, was, was diagnosed with cancer. They, they were going uh, to the hospital for, for something that seemed to be routine and, 
And then all of a sudden they, they found out at two years old she had cancer. And there was a moment in the, the early days of her treatment where Aggie couldn't walk. She was just, she was so tired and so worn out on that particular day that the chemo was just so strong she couldn't walk. And just, just a reminder to always pray for our friend Ellie Ray. Um, she's, she's been having trouble the last few weeks walking and, and, and just got, a, a, I think, a cast and some braces. So um, don't forget, don't forget to pray for Ellie Ray. But, but on that morning, when she couldn't walk, Jared and Megan, they were spent. They had nothing left. They, they were just exhausted. The weeks before had been brutal. But Megan was reading that morning out of a book. It's a collection of writings called Beside Still Waters. It's a collection of writings from Charles Spurgeon. And, and through tears, this is what she read to Jared that morning. Spurgeon said this, We have great demands but Christ has great supplies. What kind of demands do you have in your life right now? I got a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm weary from the demands in my life. I'm, I'm just in a season where the demands are high. We have great demands, but Jesus has great supplies. That's why we keep believing. Listen, the trouble will be great, okay? It will. The trouble will be great. But, but we're not whistling Dixie when we say Jesus is greater. He's greater. John Bloom said this, just because we can't control trouble does not mean trouble is in control. Jesus is in control and he's in the boat with us. Believing this completely changes the way we see the storm. It is the key to not being troubled by trouble. The key to not being troubled by trouble is this very real reality of saying, Jesus is in the boat with me. He's, he's here. He is with me. He is for me. He will never forsake me. He knows what I'm thinking. He knows what I'm feeling. He knows the supplies that I need. But I love this other bit of advice from John Bloom. He says this, don't follow your heart, follow Jesus. That may be the best advice we could get for the rest of our life. Don't follow your heart, follow Jesus. Here's why. Because your heart, if you follow your heart, your heart may tell you trust everything the doctor just said. Or your heart may tell you don't trust anything the doctor just said. See, our hearts are not great barometers because our hearts are full of all kinds of emotions. So always be careful with this, you know, kind of Western theory of, oh, just follow your heart, follow your dreams. No, don't. Danger zone. But follow Jesus because he is tried, he is true, he is trustworthy, and he has the last word. You don't, I don't, no one else does. Jesus has the last word. So follow him. Now you may be thinking, what in the world does any of this have to do with overhead doors? Come on, man, you said the sermon was overhead doors. What you talking about? Well, in 1921, C.G. Johnson led his country to invent the first overhead door, the first automatic rolling up on track door. We, we call it a, a garage door. It's known as an overhead door originally and, and still is in a lot of circles. And the overhead door changed, revolutionized how people go home, right? I mean, think about it. What, we've got rain forecast for the next seven days or something like that guess what if you've got a garage door at your house and if there's nothing in your garage and you could actually pull a car in there which is not true for my home um, you know when you get home guess what the rain is going to stay outside and, and you're going to go in that garage that, that garage door is going to roll up you're going to go inside and, and you're going to be out of the rain whatever was out there is 
is still out there. And you know, in a sense, that's true with a lot of other things, right? You pull into the driveway, that door rolls up and, and you pull in and, and in a sense, all that storm of conflict at work, well, it's, it's back at work. All of those tilt a whirl hurt feelings at school, well, they're, they're back at school. That shortage of chili at the hot dog king, well, it's back over there at the hot dog king, right? All the things that we face, well, they're, they're not there and we're, we're home. Now, truthfully, for some of our homes, when we get home, there's a whole nother storm there, you know? A whole nother tilt a whirl happening, a whole nother mosh pit of activity. But for most people in the world, home is that place where you feel at home. So what does it have to do with now? A couple of years ago, we had a mom in our church. Her son got her a very unique gift. And it's a sign that hangs up in the garage. And so every day when she gets home and that overhead door rolls up, she pulls in and right in front of her is a sign that says world's greatest mom. And, and she told me recently, she said over the last few weeks, that sign has had a big impact in her life because she's had some trouble. She, she's had some things go wrong. And being able to see those words, not just at the end of the day, right, but, but at the beginning of the day, has really made a difference. So in a sense, Jesus is looking at his closest friends, and he's saying, look, at the end of the day, when you pull up in the driveway and that garage door, that overhead door rolls up, and you pull in, there's going to be a sign that you can see in front of you, and it says, world's greatest news. Because what you just left out there in the world isn't always great news, right? But guess what? That sign's there when you leave in the morning too. World's greatest news. And guess what? You don't even have to be at home to see it. We can roll up the overhead doors in our minds all day long and see that sign that says world's greatest news. And what's that news? Well, dear Christian, here's the news, and it's direct from Jesus. Do not let your heart be troubled by trouble because your heart belongs to the world's greatest king. And his kingdom, and only his kingdom, is forever.